Hello, Joe. Uh, Steve. Hi, my brother. How are you? I'm, I'm doing well, my friend. Doing well. We're just waiting on Stephen to come in and kick it off. Hi, guys. Yeah, sorry about that. Starting off with a bit of a technical glitch. Um, just before I let the guys introduce themselves, uh, my name's Steve, by the way. I'm going to be running things uh, in the background here. Um, uh, a few housekeeping uh, points before we, before we start. Um, firstly, uh, Q&A. Uh, if you've got any uh, questions for the guys throughout the uh, webinar, we're going to be uh, coming to your questions uh, uh, after each section. If you can put your questions into the Q&A section, and we'll try and deal with as, uh, as many of those as we can. Um, we've got a few hundred people online, so I can't guarantee that we can come to everybody's question, but we'll, um, uh, we'll, 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 we'll do our best to, to get to your questions. Um, one uh, tip as well in terms of your internet performance, if, uh, if the line is uh, struggling a little bit, then just uh, uh, it would be a good idea to turn off other web-based applications uh, such as uh, your internet browser, YouTube, other streaming uh, uh, applications or, or your email clients. Um, uh, that's about it for me. Without further ado, I'm going to pass over to the guys. Um, I think we're going to start off with Steve. So over to you, Steve. Hello there, I'm Steve Rolnick. I'm speaking to you from a wildly, unusually hot card of Wales. Um, I am, I've been working with Joel on these webinars and I hope you have a brilliant time. And really all I wanna to say to begin with is um, that we've got a passionate call for action that comes from 6,000 miles away south that at the end of the webinar we'll be giving life to but just to line it up for us, we've got the most wonderful community action project in Cape Town that we are supporting with these webinars. And one reason Joel and I don't charge is because we hope you're gonna express your largesse that way. And it's a wonderfully named project called the Guardians of the National Treasure, that is children. And the project is based in one of the most deprived and violent townships in Cape Town. More later, but here's a passionate call to kind of uh, channel some energy that way. But I think for now, the energy's got to come from Joel to begin with. Hi, Joel, because you, you're 13,000 miles away or something ridiculous. Yes, I am. I'm, I'm down here in Gold Coast, Australia. Um, it, uh, it's about 11, a little after 11 o'clock at night, I think, with our guests. This, uh, this, on this show, we're covering all the time zones. And, and looking at the Q&A, we have people from all around the world joining us. So I, I'm Joel Porter. Um, some of the things that I do is I'm a, I'm a clinical psychologist. Um, I'm involved in the motivational interviewing training network world. Um, and um, I think, I've, Steve, I think I've, I met you 19 years ago in Crete and um, time flies. And so it's just, it's, just um, it's a real treat that we get to share this time together um, every three weeks or so. So I'm looking forward to tonight because we got, a, we, I think we have a, a pretty robust group crew of people joining us. I'd like to introduce um, introduce Russell now. Um, Russell's just joined us. He's he's going to be fielding some questions, and I'll let Russell introduce himself. Hi, thanks, Joe, and thanks, Steve. Yeah, I'm uh, also based here in Cardiff, UK, uh, same place as Steve. Uh, um, I work also as a, at an occupational psychologist in a, a large government department here in the UK. I've had an interest in MI for about eight years now, and for the last five years, uh, I've been a member of the Motivational Interview Network of Trainers. Uh, what I'll be doing today is looking after some questions that come in the Q&A box. Uh, uh, Stephen, uh, who will join us, will, will explain this in some housekeeping. And at appropriate points in the, 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 uh, the webinar, I'll be fielding some, some hopefully challenging questions to Joel and Steve and getting them to, to work hard. Thanks. All right. Cheers, Russell. Um, so the way the way we break this down, Steve, I just realized it'll be 20 years this month that I've known you. Um, yeah. Um, so the way the way the way we've conceptualized doing this and the way that we've decided to to approach these topics is to look at it from three dimensions: what, why, and how. So when we're talking about supporting autonomy, those are the areas we're going to be talking about and encouraging our our colleagues and our guests to come on and, and, and share some of their expertise. Um, and so now I'm going to send it over to Steve to Stephen to do the uh, to do the first poll. That's the other Stephen, isn't it? Yes. That's yeah. not me. That's the other Stephen. 
Just we're putting kind of, that we're, up to we're now, curious guys. about what all of y'all are curious about this evening or today. So just pick one and then we'll get a total up and we'll see where we go. And Stephen, whenever you're ready, whenever you feel like we've got a pretty good representation, just go ahead and show sure. the results. People, votes are still coming in thick and fast, about 60% voted. Now we'll give it just a few seconds. No worries. Yeah. It's an incredible, Joel, where people come from. Yes. All right. So over half of the folks want to understand more about supporting autonomy. Um, and I, I believe with the, uh, the conversations we're going to have this evening, um, hopefully that will, that will meet some of your, uh, your desire. All right. So Steve, why don't you uh, why don't you start off and just talk a little bit about about autonomy and how it fits into the way that you think about working with people and why it was such an important part of motivational interview. Yeah, Joel, I kind of definitely hesitated to like look up the word autonomy in the dictionary, let alone kind of put the sort of expert psychologist hat on and say autonomy is this or this or that. I thought I'd you know I'd sort of do just what what you've asked me to do, which is uh, uh, tell you, maybe tell you a story and, and give you a sense of where I think autonomy fits into constructive conversation. Um, and I kind of, after I retired, I went through this process of working and writing in education and sport. And I've kind of reached this sort of conclusion, Joel, that, that um, um, it becomes supporting autonomy becomes the the vehicle for helping someone to learn it's a very very powerful ingredient including from mistakes and i got to wonder what would happen if you chose not to support autonomy if you chose to undermine autonomy you could then ask the question how's that going to be for someone's journey and 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 their learning I'm not going to answer that question, but I did wonder about flipping it over. But I thought I could tell you a story, could I? Yes, please. Rather That's than go off on some academic thing, I thought I'd tell you a story which comes from um, my close friend and mentor, Andy Williams, from the educational field. And I once turned up at his school and he said, wow, we've just had quite a serious incident. And I thought I'd tell you what that is. A 15-year-old throws a brick through the window of the school janitor's new Jaguar. Okay. Now we have a serious problem. And there's some choices for the people like the teachers around this kid about which way to swing the conversations that are going to follow. Okay. And the routine usually is bad behavior, red light, punishment, off you go. And there are questions there about undermining someone's autonomy. And you might say, tough luck. You throw a brick through the window, you take the consequences. Okay, that'll be nice. We can discuss that with some of your guests later. But what about this, what Andy told me, right? This is what they did instead. He immediately asked the janitor, the janitor's wife, the kid's parents, and anybody else in the immediate vicinity who sought to sit around in a circle with him. And one by one, they were asked to address a series of questions. These were questions like, what happened? Everybody answered it. How did it make you feel? Everybody answered it. And now the janitor's sitting next to the boy. Picture that, right? Then one of the questions was, what would you like to do to make things better? Speak for yourself, not other people. What, what would you like to do to make things better? Notice the autonomy enhancing language. When it got round to the kid, having heard everybody else's story, the kid said, I would like to work in a butcher on Saturday mornings to try and save up the money to pay the janitor back. 
Okay. Next thing was the janitor who said, I would like to say to you that I'm very touched by your offer of working in the butcher, but I'd like to ask you not to work in the butcher. I accept your apology. I'd like you to spend your time getting on better with your schoolwork and being happier in the school. Wow. Okay. And then there was the final question, which is what could other people do to make things better for you? Okay. But the moral of that story um, is that no one was faced with agreeing or disagreeing or endorsing what the kid did. That wasn't the issue. But they found a way to support his autonomy and learn from his mistake. And so that's a different way of thinking that comes from um, the restorative justice field. But what I've just described in concrete reality was a way in which you can deal with something very serious, which could have led to exclusion from school in many places. That, that was healing for all involved. And I think a thread that ran right through Andy's story there was respect for and working with the autonomy of the people involved, particularly that kid. So that's me, instead of defining it, just painting a All picture. Right. I you wonder. mind if I put up a slide that, that it, it's not academic, but maybe it adds some to what you just said. Go for it, man, go for it. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Stephen, can you put up a slide? So, so when I was thinking about this and I was thinking about autonomy and I was thinking about the continuum. Now, a lot, a lot of my work over the years have been in, has been clinically in, in drug and alcohol and addictive behaviors. But I spent a lot of time working around corrections as well, too. And, and I know in self-determination theory, Ryan and Desi talk a lot about autonomy and they have their own continuum, which is, which is incredibly helpful. But when I was thinking about the work that I do, when I'm sitting with somebody, I thought about, well, there, there are kind of two sides to autonomy, two ends to it. There's that one end where it's control, which is I'm going to tell you what to do. And there's a, that other end, which is surrender, which is I can't do anything, so do whatever you want to do. Uh, and I think when we're talking about supporting autonomy in a, in, a, in a relational kind of way, we're talking about let's figure out what's important to you, what could be helpful to you, and let's talk about that together. I, I think there's a shadow or a dark side to this, which is when you get people manipulating people and, and they already have an idea of where they want the person to go, but they're mm. just going to try to trick them into getting there or do yeah. it through, um, through, a, through, a, through, a, through a very unhelpful Socratic questioning kind of way. And then there's another thing that happens, which is really dangerous, which is when a helper starts colluding with, with somebody who's seeking help in which they, they come up with a secret agreement about how they're going to, how they're going to get the person what they want or how they're going to figure out to do something together which leads really into a lot of ethical issues yeah. but so but to get back to this little continuum this is sort of the way i think about it between it, whether you're a parent or you're a teacher or you're a coach or you're a clinician autonomy isn't just one thing um but what's not helpful i i think is trying to tell people what to do and maybe our guests will will come, will uh, be able to help expand upon that, nor is it helpful to, to collapse into this place of surrender where you feel like you can't do anything. So I'm, I'm just gonna, you just do whatever you wanna do. I'm gonna take my hands off and you, you kind of give up when, when actually maybe if you put some effort into a relationship, you could come up with what to do together. Wow. Wow, you know, just a quick comment. It, it rings sure. an incredibly familiar bell with the field of maternal scaffolding. Mm. where They say that mothers who've been traumatized by rape, war and abuse tend to swing one to one of those two extremes. They let the children just get on with it, if you like, that's the sort of collusion thing. Or they just tell them what to do all the time. Either way, there's not uh, quality learning happening for the child you see what I yes. mean? And they Absolutely. say, if you help the mothers to reoccupy the center ground where they collaborate with the child, you get better outcomes. Absolutely. And then that's true in education and that's true in, in lots of areas. It's, I mean, the, we could talk about scaffolding for a whole hour and a half and the importance of that. But 
I would encourage people that aren't familiar with it to look into it. Now we're going to bring on somebody, both you and I um, are know pretty well, Steve. We're going to, we're going to bring on Frederick, Frederick Eliasson from Sweden. Um, and, and Frederick, what I'd like for you to do is I'd like for you to, do, to introduce yourself, some of your area of work, and, and then Steve and you and I will have a conversation about supporting autonomy within the area of corrections. And, and when we're talking about corrections tonight, we're talking about prisons and probation and parole, not necessarily policing, because that's a, that's a different world than, 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 than where, where you spent so much of your career. Yep. So welcome, Freddie. It's great to see you. I miss you, and I'm glad you decided to join us. Thank you, guys. Uh, wonderful to be a, a part of this. So um, my name is Frederick. Uh, I'm a social worker for more than 20 years now. And I work most of my professional life within sort of closed institutions, prisons, um, mandated youth care, that type of, of, of situations. And today I divide my time between being a, a self-employed consultant with sort of leadership and um, uh, organizational development stuff. And I also work um, for a Swedish government agency um, that delivers individual tailored compulsory care for young people. So all of the sort of mandated youth care in Sweden is uh, at a, under one government agency. Okay. And I'm responsible for, for uh, providing training in, in motivational interviewing for 4,000 employees uh, within that sort of government government body. So this is this is something that's sort of really close to my heart. Uh, and one thing that I feel passionate about is how you can support people's autonomy in situations where a lot of, of their choices and, and their ability to have power over their own life is very restricted, it's very limited. So that sort of poses uh, a couple of questions, I guess, on, on how do you support autonomy when there is so much um, control, uh, right. say it's a prison or it's mandated care, there are so many control factors that influence a person's life. Uh, so that makes autonomy support, in my view, tricky. Yeah. How, how is it tricky? What, where, 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 are the, where are the tricky areas in that? Well, uh, to, to sort of piggyback on, on what you both were, were um, talking about earlier, within that controlled environment, um, it's so, it's, it's even more easy because there's so much of the culture of the sort of workplace that goes for control. We tell you what to do and, and we want compliance. And if you get compliance, we will reward that very heavily. So if a, a youth or, or an inmate complies to what we, what we want, we will be very happy and, and we will in, in, in different ways um, uh, say something or do something that will encourage compliance. So that's one thing. The, the other thing is that when you try to as we do in MI, say something about like you're the one that's controlling your life and what you want to do is up to you and that kind of sort of statements that we that we would say would be autonomy supporting and um, it's, it's very tricky in a situation where there is such a power imbalance between the sort of helper and the, and the inmate or the youth it come it, it, and the environment. So it's very easy to make that kind of statements come true as sarcasm. Yes. So, so, what, yeah, so. Go ahead, go ahead, Frederick. Keep going. No, so, 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 so when you, when you, when you train, train people to be autonomy supporting in that environment, you need to put quite a lot of time talking about sort of the, the, the mindset from which autonomy support comes from. 
because if you have a mindset of control and you just sort of teach them the skill of saying, well, it's up to you what you do, and right. they go out and try that, it will often kick back as, are you stupid? I'm in prison. I don't decide anything. You decide everything for me. How can you say it's up? So, so, so yeah. that's sort of, that's, that's my first thing that comes to mind when talking about autonomy support in very restricted environments. What about, what about when you're working with the correction staff? And you're talking about autonomy. What sort of what sort of pushback do you get from people when you when you're saying to a probation officer or somebody who's working in a in a detention facility that you know it's up to the person what they want to do? Mm. Well, I think it's very similar from from that type of environment and um, a lot of of. Um, uh, substance abuse, abuse programs and stuff like that. And it's a, it's a pa paternalistic um, culture. We know what's best for you. And if you just listen to us and do what we say, you're going to do better. So even if, if the, the officers or the staff really want to be helpful, I mean, if we, if we take that as, as the first thing, they're not just want to punish people because that's that's a different area and not that common if I'm if I'm should be true that they want to like they should be punished if they are punished severely they won't do it again I don't meet that too often wow. so I meet staff that wants to be helpful but they think the way to be helpful is telling people what to do yeah because wow. if they knew what to do they wouldn't be in this kind of trouble anyway would they that yes. type of Atmosphere. Yeah. Yeah. And so, Frederick, you're saying there's a problem here because built into the institution, there's this power differential that yes. makes it um, quite difficult yes. to practice a form of conversation like motivational interviewing or whatever you want to call it mm -hmm. that is autonomy supportive. Yes, I think so. I think so. Both in, in, in terms of mindset. I remember you said once, Steve, that MI is a combination of attitude and skills. Yeah. Um, so, so, work, so training people in that environment, it's sort of extra important to work around what type of attitude do we have to the work that we do? How are we helpful? What's, how do we view people? What yeah. are our mindsets? So that would be a, a big part of a training. And uh, the skill set, if not, if we don't talk about the attitude or the spirit or, or whatever we want to call it, we just teach skills, it, it won't come through. Uh, especially, maybe not in any environment, but especially in that environment, it will not, it simply won't work in my opinion. You. Yeah, yeah I, I was working. I was working with a group of probation officers in New Zealand years ago, and I was talking about supporting autonomy and was, and a lot of the the spirit of MI and and, and the the person centered way of working with people, and um, and and I had one of the guys come up to me in the break. He said, "You know, Joel, this is really good stuff. But if my colleagues saw me doing this, they would think I was soft." Yeah. And I'm wondering yeah. what you're finding is helpful in shifting that paradigm of my, 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 what you're saying makes sense, but what I need to do is, you know, be more authoritative with people. What, yeah. what are you finding that helps shift that paradigm where people can actually embrace the importance of supporting autonomy, autonomy mm -hmm even within a very restrictive framework. Mm. Let, let me first say that I think it's possible to do that. I've seen the shift in a workplace from a more authoritarian, paternalistic way of working into a more person-centered way of working, even though the restrictions and the control are still there. So, so that would be a first, but it's hard. And training the way that we do is just one little piece of the puzzle that needs to be in place for that cultural shift to happen. 
And, and one way of looking at it is to, to take some knowledge from implementation science. And that might be extra important if we want to do like that quite severe or severe, I don't know if that's the word for it, but quite um, big cultural shift. Um, and one way of thinking about it is that you need to have the leadership of an organization wanting that shift to happen and, and seeing or, or help them to see their um, significant role in sort of modeling and modeling behaviors that that we would say is person-centered and right. and rewarding the staff when they do behaviors that we think is is sort of person-centered and then gradually the the um, shift happens so you're talking about systemic change yes within yes. an organization precisely yeah that it doesn't, it's not about the workers doing something different. It's actually about an organization embracing a way to work. Yeah, because what, what, what tends to happen otherwise is that a, a, a small part of the people who train thinks, oh, this is wonderful. This is exactly the way I want to work. This, this goes right to my own values of how I want to be with people. And then they come back into the organization and they find themselves quite lonely in that. And they tend to quit once they sort of open their eyes to a new way of working and they don't get support in the group or the organization they're in, they tend to be the one that quits. Yeah. yeah. But if yeah, yeah. But attrition if, is, a, it can be helpful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so Frederick, I could keep talking with you as I always do for a long time, but right now Russell has a question. I think that's coming for you that we'd like to offer. Russell, what do you what do you have? Yeah, sorry, I was just trying to get on unmuted there. Um, that there are, uh, we've got quite a few really searching questions have come in here, uh, and I'm going to uh, uh, ask Frederick one that's come in from Jody Pitt. Um, uh, Jody has asked that how do you balance or encourage autonomy with with those who continue to make unwise choices? For example, people who are quite likely to die if they don't get an alcohol detox? Well, I, I think that that question uh, is, is not solely uh, my, my area of expertise. I think we'd say both Joel and, and, and Steve have uh, far more experience than I have um, concerning that question. But since it was asked to me, I would go back to the offering of information and we have sort of specific ways of, of offering information um, with, with, with motivational interviewing, where we first ask a, a person, what are their own thoughts uh, about their drinking and how the drinking affects their health and what they think might be the consequences of their drinking. And then we offer um, information. And then we tell them what, what we think might be uh, a problem or the consequences of their drinking and, and, and try to do that in, in an, as neutral uh, way we, we, we can and then ask people to, to, to think about how they receive that information or what, what they would like to, if anything, would like to do with that. Steve, yeah, yeah. Well, the last webinar, Steve, isn't that what Judith talked about? She talked about, you know, the ask, provide, ask way yeah, of, of sharing with people to try to engage with them about decisions about themselves in a collaborative way. Mm. Wow, it gets really tricky. There's some, I noticed some incredible questions there, Russell. I don't know how on earth you get to pick them out, but you know, Terry Moyers has asked a question and then Jess Branch is, I know who I happen to know is in Kenya, is asking a really interesting question about people who are kind of effectively traumatized and, and might experience autonomy supporters abandonment. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I've just got a bias and, and I feel like I want to acknowledge it, which is that surely what this points to is whatever the environment, whether it's a criminal justice or a sports club or wherever, um, placing high value on engaging with people and forming a relationship with them, which to some degree allows that power differential to kind of even itself out of it. Then 
it's there's no way of prescribing how to proceed because as Jess is sort of saying, look, some people will experience autonomy support as abandonment, but you at least start with that sense of collaboration where the power differential has been kind of at least adjusted temporarily. But that's my bias, I must confess, Frederick. Uh, but I've got, I've got incredible memories 20, 30 years ago of going through the Swedish criminal justice system with Carlo Kofabring and trying to wash MI down over the whole system. Mm -hmm. And so, boy, oh boy, do I take to heart what you're saying is that you need leaders who can walk the talk and express the values. Yeah. You probably also need some folk down the bottom who are capable of lighting fires that others yes. get attracted to. But yeah. anyway, that's fantasy talk about culture change. I know that's not our primary focus now. <laughs> But, but you, you, you'll find yourself there if you want to make those like big changes within within organization. And if I could just sort of, again, piggyback on what, what, what you were saying, Stephen, and, and, and in, a, in a, an environment where a lot of choice is, is taken away from people, that if you, if you want to be helpful to someone, I would say that there are two things that you would like to accomplish as, as a helper sort of before thinking about autonomous support or saying things like, you know, what you do with your circumstances is up to you and stuff like that. And, and the first thing is that the people, the, the person that you want to help feels understood by you. That would be my go-to thing. That would be the first thing. And we have some, some, some skills practice for that within sort of MI and, and client center therapy and stuff like that. So that would be the first one to, 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 to get a sense that you get it, all of that frustration, all of that anger, maybe all of that loss of hope that someone that find themselves in those circumstances experience to meet someone that that gives you a sense of of getting that horrible situation that you find yourself in would be like paramount. And, and the other thing would be that the person you are meeting feels accepted and valued as a human being by you. And if you manage those two, I think most of it is, is sort of done. I think those are like the... Yeah, and I'm smiling because I, I know there are lots of colleagues from the field of sport tuned into this webinar. And you could have been describing a sports environment. So, hey, Frederick, we're going to bring you back at the round table. Um, we, this, is, this is great. Thanks for joining us. Um, we, we, we're bringing Margot Bristow on next to talk about working with young people and around autonomy. Um, so we're going to come back. And so you're going to be able to, to share some more. Um, thank you so much, man. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to hang out with Steve and I and, and, and share your experience. Honored I think to those be here. The points that you just said are pivotal, absolutely pivotal. Thank you. All right. So, so with that, we're gonna, we're gonna bid farewell to, to Frederick for just a, a little while, he'll be back. And now we're going to bring on um, another, another person that Steve and I both know from Chicago in the USA, uh, Margo Bristow, who is a, um, Who's a, who's a, who is a um, quite an amazing person in and of herself, um, but in regards to working with young people, she's dedicated a lot of her career in um, helping young people and their families overcome a lot of difficult and tricky situations. So Margo, hello. Good Great morning, how are y'all? It is morning here, by the way, bright and early. Yes, it is. We're, we're, covering the, we're covering the whole time zone tonight. Yeah. Um, so, Margo, would you like to just introduce yourself a little bit, and then we'll, we'll start talking? Absolutely. Um, I have been part of the uh, Motivational Interviewing Network for Trainers for 13 years. I figured out this morning, I felt, oh, I thought I was a youngie. And I'm not. Um, I have been in the mental health field, criminal justice, child welfare field, um, gambling and process addictions. I know it's all over the place um, for about 35 years. Um, and at this point, um, my focus is, has been youth and youth and youth and youth. 
I'm not a classic kind of therapist in that when I'm working with kids, I don't work with them alone. I won't work with them in isolation. I will work with them with parents, but the kids run the show. Um, with my, I, I got into working with youth in trial and error. When I was working at a hospital, I was told, you're too young to work with adults. You look too young. And this is when I was 20 years old. And they said, adults will not respect you. So go work with the kids. Um, and so this was back in the 80s. And I decided, OK, I'll work with the kids and I'll do what the kids do. And so I sat on the floors and had sessions and talked to kids on the floors. We'd go for walks. We'd go to the gym. We would, wherever they wanted to meet, that's where I met. And it felt like at that point that I was really trying to um, work in a way that felt natural and normal and not with, without any pretense. And that's been my focus throughout my career is that as soon as I start trying to be expert adult and have that, I'm going to fix you and I'm going to use psychobabble, I lose my kids. Um, and, I know I probably didn't introduce myself well there, but that's okay. Um, I was asked to talk about a case. Um, and I really, I think it's the epitome of autonomy support when I talk about working with, my, with the kids. And I call them my kids because a lot of these kids that come into treatment with me have been through three or four or five different therapists. The family has fired them. The kid has fired them. There's been breaches of confidentiality. Um, a lot of the kids feel I talked to this therapist and they told my parents this, this, this. Once that happens in that therapeutic relationship, that child is lost, at least to that therapist. When they finally come to me, most of my work with them is through a very soft engagement process and empowerment because if they're empowered, they feel that autonomy. And if they're empowered and we have an alliance in working together, then they feel supportive where they can take some extra risks. Um, when I'm working with the kids as well, parents have to be involved. Every third session, there is a parent in a session. Well, because parents need to know that kids are making changes and they don't trust what happens at home. I always tell the kids, you're gonna make changes immediately and you're going to incorporate them because that's how you work, that's how you think. Your parents aren't gonna trust that and they're not gonna trust it at all unless there is something with a witness that could help coordinate that process and that there can be checks and balances with. And I'm that person that provides that role with the caveat that the kid sets the agenda. It's not the parents. Oh, well, I imagine that can create some issues in the therapy when the parent's agenda is this and the kid's agenda is this, particularly around substance use. How do you, how do you negotiate that in terms of supporting the autonomy of the child, but also the parents feeling like they need to be parenting? Well, that's the very first session. Um, when I meet with the families and the kids the very first session, I tell them I'm a harm reductionist. I'm not an abstinence-based therapist. Right. And if they're expecting abstinence, they're not going to get it in the therapy with me. And then I tell the kid, if your parents are expecting abstinence, just know there are consequences to that behavior. And so what consequences are you willing to adopt and take on? And which ones are you not willing to take on? If it becomes too uncomfortable for you with those consequences, then let's look at modifying your behavior or stopping and see what happens. Okay. And oftentimes my kids select abstinence within three to six months of starting treatment. Okay. Well, I, don't, I don't want to derail your, the case you're about to talk about, but you really piqued my interest with a couple of those things. I have been working with this young man off and on for about four years. And I mean off and on. He only comes when he feels he needs to have refreshers or he just needs to navigate another stage of life. Um, as a caveat or as a little background, I always talk about brain development with my clients and their parents and stages of brain development that 
adolescents are kids in grown up bodies that oftentimes they're making impulsive behaviors because of where they are in the brain development stages. Um, as well as talking about individuation and how adolescents are always fighting, staying within the family, leaving the family, coming back in and checking, and knowing that, that there has to be some, some give from the parents and the restrictiveness cannot happen. So with that being said, this young man came to treatment. I saw his brother and his brother ended up going into residential because his brother was at a higher risk factor than, than he was. So I started seeing this young man when he was 16 and he, first of all, was using marijuana every day, four to five times a day, became engaged in highly, highly um, risky sexual behavior with a partner that um, was bipolar and was cutting and wanted to engage him in that process. And he started engaging in that process as part of their sexual activity together. Um, his father, um, if any of the children in the family rebelled against dad by saying no or questioning it, there was physical abuse. I made numerous um, calls to Child Protective Services with this family. So there's, it was high risk in many, many different areas. Mother is, is highly, highly protective, alcoholic. So, and in and out of the house. So lots of chaos going on in this house. And this young man, um, social isolation, um, has social anxiety that he could not leave the house at times, could not make it to school, would um, just stress about going to school. How does my hair look? How do my clothes look? What are people going to think about me? Do I have friends? The only friends I have are people that use. I don't want to use all the time, but the only way I can do that is, mm. is by using it to be with them. Mm. So he had all of this confusion going on. And the very first session I asked, the father did not attend, but the mother attended. The very first session I said, what do you want? She said, I want him safe. And I said, okay. And I said, what does that mean to you? And she said, I'd like him to stop using. And then I looked at him and I said, is that a possibility? I didn't say, did you hear what your mom said? I said, is that a possibility? And he said to me, I have to have a lot of other things taken care of because using makes me comfortable to be around other people. Mm -hmm. And so I, I looked at mom, I said, he's not going to stop using. We have to work on other protective factors before that happens. And I looked at him, I said, so what do you want to start with? And he said, I want to get to school. I want to be comfortable in school where I'm not worried about everyone. I said, okay. And what we did is we did some, um, desensitization and systematic des desensitization to get him to get to school. And mm -hmm. he found certain checkpoints and we looked at resource people in the school, but he's the one that came up with all those resource people. He's the one that identified them. He's the one that contacted them and said, hey, can I check with you during the day? And they would say, yes. One was a cafeteria worker who he really liked kidding around with. And he would check in with him every day, first thing in the morning, and just said, if I'm not here by such, 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 such and such time, can you text me? And the cafeteria worker said, yes, I can. Wow. So he became really resourceful in how he could, he figured out who he could talk to and how he could talk to them. But it was only because mom said, do what you need to do, and it's okay. He still used he went from using every day, multiple times a day. And as he became more resourceful, he, his usage decreased. At present time, he's in college now, and now he's only smoking on the weekends. Which, pardon? I'm just needing to manage the time a little bit here. I'm just wondering, sure. Steve, what are your thoughts as you've been listening to Margot's, Margot talk? Yeah, I'm filtering this, Margot, hi, I'm filtering this through my recent experience in education and sport. And I'm just noticing how, as complex as that case is, as, as riddled with problems and pathology as it is, 
there's something about the way you started it off and navigated it that seems very powerful and easily reproducible in other settings. In other words, your starter question was a very simple one. What do you think about that? What do you think is the best way forward here? And um, that strikes me as, as widely relevant um, in other settings. Yeah, and it's always about what he thinks and it's always about what he wants to do. Yeah. And then we look at resources. And if he doesn't have any, I'll ask, can I make a couple of suggestions? And yeah. he'll say, well, yeah, let me, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. I said, how would that fit for you? And how would you like to make it fit for you? Because yeah. I never say that my ideas are the way to go because I'm 61. He's 16, 17, 18. I have, I'm not in that body. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant, Margo, brilliant. I think, I think there's a question for you. Russell, do you have, do you have a question? Yeah, uh, there's again, quite a number of good questions coming in, but one that caught my eye that came in earlier from Melly, Kentucky. And Melik talks about the, the, the conservative and paternalistic culture that dominates society there and the kids that are coming through there. The, it's, it's really hard to develop autonomy with them, uh, and particularly when they grow into adulthood. And when they see a counsellor, they often expect to be corrected and not in a subtle way. So how would, how would you recommend introducing uh, autonomous, autonomy support into that cultural environment? And it's pervasive here. It's a 12 step, you have to do it this way, no other way um, in many ways here. Um, the best way is inviting the client to say what they want and having them set the agenda. It's just, you know, and you can do it in an individual basis. You can do it in a group setting. Um, when I do supervision or consultation, I'll always say, so what are the client's thoughts on this? And so I never ask the therapist what their thoughts are. What are the client's thoughts? And what did you do when you heard those thoughts about the client? So it changes the dialogue um, from I'm the expert and I have all the information to the client's the expert and they have the information. So Margot, what, do you, what would you do if, uh, I noticed this question came in, Russell, from someone in the Netherlands, I think. Um, a kid's lying to you. They're protecting themselves one way or another. If you don't confront the lie and you just say, well, when the information, when you're ready to share information with me, I'm here for you. And I know that you need to protect yourself and you need to, you need to develop trust. I need to develop trust. I need to earn your trust. Yeah. And that takes time. So you see a lying kid, not as having a problem, which is lying, but you see it as a reflection on the challenge for you to connect better with them so that they feel less protective. Right. And in virtual world, I can't connect the same way as I do in my office. In my office, it looks like a teenager's bedroom in many ways. I have toys everywhere. I have lots of pillows. I have color and everything. I mean, feet are up on tables. It's very, very relaxed. A lot of my teenagers lie on the couch, not because it's psychoanalytic, but because it's a comfy couch and that's what they do. <laughs> All right, Margo, we're going to, we're going to um, we're going to we're going to shift gears, and we're and we're going to bring you back. All right, thank we, you. Hey, thank you, thank you for donating your time and and hanging out with us. Um, you know, it's a real treat. And again, these are really rich areas that we're talking about: corrections and adolescents and families, and we could go on and on. Um, and hopefully, people are getting some ideas about what they can do and, and the way they think about things. Mm -hmm. um, and that's always a treat. Thank you so much, Margo. We'll see you in a little bit. See you soon. Cool. All right, we have a second poll. Um, and if Stephen can bring that up, that'd be great. I love it when you look at that surprise look, Joel. Yeah, I think I caught him off guard because I missed it the first round. <laughs> <laughs>
I'll be interested to see how this one pulls up. I think most people have voted now, guys. So I'm going to end that poll if that's right with you, Joe. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Cool. Makes sense to me. All right. Thanks, everybody, for participating. Well, now we have a short video we'd like to show before we bring on our next guest, Brendan Murphy from Claire Morris, Ireland. I know this is a bit, sounds like an interrogation, but what I'm trying no, to do is get a handle to see how dependent you are on the alcohol physically, which is really important for us to know, to know whether you need a detox or not. What's a detox? A detox. A detox is when um, you're drinking so much that you can't stop without help and we bring you into our unit here or at home if you've got enough support and you're not drinking at too high levels and we give you some medicine that helps you withdraw from the alcohol. Serious? Serious. And how does that work exactly? I mean, how does that start? How's that initiated? How's that initiated? Yeah. Um, as I'm not quite following your track, but it's initiated by you Sorry, coming no, in whose here. Whose decision is this now? Oh, whose decision is this? Yeah. Well, like I said, you know, where you've come to today, we um, specialise in assessing for alcohol dependence. So, of course, we work with you, yeah. but you know, we we at some point we have to advise you what to do for your own health and safety. Right. Advise me. Hmm. Of course, the ultimate choice is yours um, if you choose not to have any help. But if you're dependent on alcohol and you need help to stop, you, there's some quite severe health consequences. Yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, I'm aware of the health consequences to the extent that you can have a really boring life and, and live a long one, and you can have an interesting life and, and have a bit of adventure and, and live a, sh a slightly shorter one. Um, I'm cool with that choice. I'm, I'm just, to be honest with you, uh, from where I'm at, is that the only choice there is, or is that? Well, uh, we're just getting along the way for me to find out how much you are drinking and how serious it is. But if you're dependent on alcohol and you're drinking at high enough levels, if you stop drinking without assistance, you could have a seizure or have a coma or die. So, you know, it, okay. it's really important that right, um, right. we look at what's happening for you today. Okay, well, I, I didn't sort of, I didn't, wasn't looking at it in that way. I didn't think it was that serious. I, I sort of was thinking more along the lines of, I don't know what I was thinking. I was just thinking it'd be good to, to be honest, to just keep back to my, with my wife. I hadn't really thought through what might, uh, yeah. So I, haven't, I don't know if I'm really ready for, uh, I don't know. Maybe I'm not ready for this. Okay. Okay, should, but should we continue on anyway? Because uh, it's really important that I get a, an idea yeah. of if you're going to run into trouble or not. Right, yeah. And, and give you some advice about, you know, what you can do. Right. Okay. You seem a little unsure? Um, I, I, I kind of think, well, you're doing ambulance at the cliff stuff, you, at the bottom of the cliff, you're still thinking worst case scenario. So I think you're saying if I stopped drinking completely, I'd need help, but maybe that's not the only thing I have to do here, you know. Hmm. You, you Absolutely. Know, so the choice is mine, right? Yes. Okay, yep, yes. okay, okay, cool, cool, cool. Yeah, I just had a bit of a, I had to make a bit of a leap there. <laughs> I hadn't really thought this through, to be honest. Hmm. And I'm feeling a bit foggy today, so that's all good. So it sounds to me like you're running a very fine line with being dependent on alcohol, needing to drink because your body needs it, um, which would probably indicate that you may require a detox. Right.
All right, welcome back. Um, so that, that's a video that, um, that, um, that we made in New Zealand several years ago uh, from the Ministry of Health done with uh, another colleague of ours, Ken McMaster. And, um, and that's a negative practice video. What I wanna do now is I wanna bring Brendan on. Uh, Brendan Murphy is a, is a longtime um, colleague and friend of, of both Steve and I, and he's in Claire Morris, Ireland. Um, and Brendan, I want you to introduce yourself and I'd love to hear what your comments are on, on watching that video. Hi guys, can you hear me and see me okay at that now? Yeah, Not good, clear. good, great. Uh, I was I was just smiling my head off when I saw that, Joel, because I hadn't seen it in maybe, I don't know, five or six years at least, but I love it. It's just, it's so good that, you know, she's, she's telling this guy what he needs to do and all of that. And he's like going, seriously? <laughs> it's like, there's just some lovely moments in it like that, yeah. Um, anyhow, look, thanks for having me on. Um, I, uh, I do a bit of work as a counselor uh, and I do some training and I supervise some other therapists. And um, I've been kind of around the drug and alcohol field for the best part of 30 years, doing a number of different roles, including working in some sporting organizations and working in the uh, uh, Ireland's health service and working as a private practitioner. So a mix of uh, different things like that. So that's a little bit about me. That's enough about me. All right, well, good. Let's make use of the time that we have with you. Okay. So you've listened to, you've listened to Frederick and you've listened to, um, to Margot talk. And one of the things um, that, that is really clear, particularly in areas like drug and alcohol work or addictions work, is, is, what, is what we've talked about before, that writing reflex of wanting to tell people what to do when they're, when they're heading into harm's way. Mm. What, are, what are your thoughts about that, particularly working with people in the spirit of, of supporting their autonomy? Yeah, yeah. I think there's, there's a... Um we can allude we can just go back to the um piece that you showed earlier on the slide joel and that um idea of collapsing or surrendering at one end and controlling at the other with the supporting autonomy in the middle is lovely because it's it's this thing it's often a journey that workers workers make sometimes they kind of collapse and surrender and give in and then other times that they um, become very controlling about things. And one of the times that people become very controlling is exactly as you said, is if they are afraid that somebody is going to come into harm's way. So that if you're working with a person whose behavior, uh, that there's maybe self-harming behaviors or potentially around suicide or that their drug use is really, really extreme and harmful and dangerous to them, that it just triggers this thing in us to stop supporting them and start moving towards controlling them. Um, and at other times, you know, where we can we can just go the other way, where we can surrender, we can kind of give up or give in and allow people to kind of go, well, it's up to you, whatever way that you want to do it. Um, so that's a, it. It's not just the kind of the client that moves up and down that it's the therapist or it's the worker as well who's going along that. And, and how do you, how do you negotiate that, particularly when you're working with a client who who's, who's at risk. Mm, mm. Well, there's a couple of things that that's um, really important that Frederick and Margo and yourself and Steve have already alluded to. But one of the things is you got to be able to first of all kind of make that connection with people about that where they feel like you get them, they feel like you understand them, and it's not. This is not about agreeing or disagreeing control or surrender this is about a sense of of a felt experience about uh, that that this person gets me in some way and one think? of the ways i think that's that's really helpful around doing that is just to pay attention to the emotion behind what it is that they're doing so for instance if somebody says to me this is something i really want because you know i'm going to lose my job or or or, or like my my 
husband's going to leave me or that there's going to be, you know, this is going to, and I'd say, you're really afraid of that. You, that's something you really don't want to happen and do, and you're getting all these head nods like that where they're kind of going yeah yeah that's it that's it it's almost like you get it you get i need to do something about this because of this thing that's happening in me so so that sense and both frederick and margot um uh, uh uh give examples of that that sense of really being being attuned to a person is really kind of uh, i think first step um, around it. And then maybe if I could, I'd, I'd say the second step to it is a little bit about holding your own space. There's kind of a bit of ground that you need to hold yourself. And I call it the middle ground where you're not too swayed one way towards control or too swayed the other way towards, towards surrender, but this middle ground where, where it's like, okay, I, I hear what it's like for you. I get what it's like for you. And I'm getting an understanding of what's going on. But I also got to hold true to what I know and what's right for me. Um, and and that that's where our own kind of professional knowledge and competency and expertise comes in yeah. so that we're not sliding all over the place. Yeah. And Brendan, I noticed this question from Terry Moyers there, you know, how, mm-hmm. what do we think about the fact that there's a certain amount of evidence that, uh, giving people straightforward advice does lead to change which and she cites this primary care field and i kind of feel that that it you know researchers and us as well tend to polarize things is we either tell people what to do or we kind of surrender and let them make their minds Mm. up for themselves when really if you do occupy this middle ground you can have complete freedom to say what you think and give someone advice because they'll Mm. respect you because at the same time you're respecting their views as well, and you've got a good connection with them. So I don't know what to say to you, Terry. I, I just think if you if you operate at either end, then as we saw in the video, it just it just doesn't work. And to start off mm-hmm. with asking Margot's question, coming alongside, collaborating with someone, then it's fine to give them firm advice. Mm-hmm. But in the ab- in the absence of a connection, that's where I suppose. Terry, the three of us would say giving someone firm advice in the absence of, of, of connection is going to lead to trouble. It's going to cause more harm than good. Yeah. So, and well, and if I could, to... yeah. Sorry, Joel, go ahead. Go please. ahead, Brendan. No, go ahead. No, I, I, I just because in, in terms of from coming on here today and, and, and um, Joel, that you'd ask, would I maybe give an example or talk about about an example of using this? If I could just mention briefly, just um, that this is maybe last spring. It was before summer, Anya, last year, um, and um, so 2019. I uh, phone rings one day. I don't know the number. I pick up the number, and and this guy's voice on the phone. He says, "Do you do control drinking? Like, what's going on here?" I was like. I said, uh, yeah, yeah, I do. And uh, he said, good, good. He says, I'm, he says, I've been drinking a bit too much and I need to like, I need to just rein it in a little bit. I need to wind it in a little bit. And I go, okay. And we start talking a little bit like that. So it just kind of, it's, it's out there sort of straight away what this guy is, is interested in. So we agreed to meet and we, uh, I find out he's, he's a professional guy. He's in his forties. He's got three children. He's married. Um, he's, um, uh, but as it turns out, he's got quite a significant history of drinking and he's also had, he's, he's been to see a couple of other therapists in a while and he's had a, he's completed a six week program in a residential facility as well. Um, and a couple of years ago, and the most he's managed in terms of abstinence has been about three months and um, period, short periods of two or three months. So um, he's he's talking about it and and he says, I want to control this drinking. I want to cut it down a little bit, but I don't want to stop. He says, I can never see myself not drinking. And I said, OK, I said, well, tell me a little bit about why you want to cut it down. And he said, because of my work, because it's causing a lot of trouble with my wife, because of this, because of it. And he, he listed out a bunch of things. So what I said to him then is, look, that makes a lot of sense to me, what you're saying. You're doing it too much. You want to keep doing it, but you want it less. You want less of these problems, less of this pain, less of this struggle in your life. You want that. And he was like giving it lots of the head nods of, yes, that's it. That's exactly what I want. 
So I think it kind of came from that part of just understanding or maybe getting a bit of a sense of what it was like for him and what it was that he really wanted and, and the things he wanted to avoid. And, and that was really the, just the start of, of our relationship. Um, and then just consequently after that, I mean, when I, I said it to him, I said, okay, look, what you're about to do is a tough thing. I said, it's probably easier to stop for lots of people than manage this weird thing of trying to control your drinking. I said, it's a tough thing to do, but if you want to do it, let's have a go at doing this together. And, and you know, he was on board from, from, from early on. I think maybe just because it was, it was paying attention to what was really important to him. So you found that middle ground. I, well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's this thing, it's not, it's not, I suppose that I, I think it's, exa it's middle-ish, it's kind of middle-ish rather than being out here or being out here. It kind of moves around a little bit in the middle, but like yeah. one of the questions I said to him was like, okay, how will we know if this isn't working? If we're trying and we're trying, we're trying a few different things. I said, there's some things we can try for sure, but how will we know if it's not working? How will I know to just kind of say, okay, we got to call this here that it's not working. So we kind of were setting up a little bit of a, a, of a, a red flag that either of us could pick up later on and start waving and saying, look, this, this, this isn't going to work. Um, I said, because for lots of people that try controlling drinking, they can't control it and they find they have to stop. And, and he went, well, look, if, we can, if I can't control it, then I'll know I'll have to stop, but I'll know I've given it my best shot. Yeah. Everybody else I spoke to and everywhere else I went, it was just about, you must stop, you must stop, you must stop. Wow. He said, wow. if you let me try this, mm. um, then I will know. And I said to the guy, the most obvious thing, I said, I can't stop you trying this. Of course, this is up to you. And he's going, right, let's do it. So, so it really, you know, it was, it was really lovely. It was... The guy kind of arrived ready to work, but he just needed somebody to kind of go, yeah, this is what, hear what was important to him and said, let's do this. Let's, let's go with this then, yeah. but, but not whatever you want. Let's go with this, but let's actually put a bit of a boundary around it. But, but contain it in some way. Yeah, contain yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I want to do a couple things before we shift and move into the round table. One is, I was thinking about Terry's question, which is, you know, with, why don't you just tell people what to do? There's some evidence behind it. And, and my guess would be that there is a, I wouldn't know what percentage of people who find themselves in a, in a situation where they need that kind of advice. But for those people, if you tell them what to do and they do it, that's great. The, the, the reality is a lot of people get told what to do and they don't do it and they get quite stuck. And so there, I think it's good to have something else to offer than just advice um, and just more advice and more firm and more stern advice. Um, because we know that just persuading people with logic doesn't actually create behavior change with, the, with, with specific groups of people. Um, Steve, I wanna pass it over to you just to kind of pull this conversation with Brendan together to summarize it or comment how you want. And yeah, then you, send it over to Russell for a question. Yeah, then I'll hand it over to Russell. You know, Brendan, when I listen to you and indeed to Margot and, and, and Frederick as well, actually, if I think about like, what is it that you that you did and said that was key? You know, they're, they, they're very thoughtful opening questions, you know, often about what is it that you really want and, and, and listening to what someone says and how they feel about it. Now, if I could wave a magic wand, it, it, you know, we could look at you and Margot and Frederick and say, oh, well, you're specialists. But, but, you know, I spoke to an international elite athlete this morning, and he was telling me about his experience in a particular club. And he says, the thing is, they often used to tell me what to do with my technique without finding out what I thought. Now, that's not giving advice. That's just dumping. You know, it's not skillful advice giving, it's just dumping. And he, he said, otherwise, I went through like the last year and nobody, nobody came to me and said, how do you think I can improve my whatever it is? I don't want to reveal the name uh, or the sport. But you see what I mean? He was, what he was saying was his experience was that they, people did everything but 
ask the simple questions that you, Frederick, and Margot have clarified. And I, I kind of personally feel this doesn't have to be the terrain of, of psychotherapists and counselors. This is, some, this is actually what you're doing. It's very skillful. It's remarkably skillful, but it's very simple as well. Anyway, that's... Uh, I, Can I just come in on one thing, Steve, yeah. which hopefully kind of, I think, it does, I think, chime with what you're saying, but maybe is even more clarifying for people. When anyone is having a conversation with somebody about supporting autonomy, this autonomy support that we're talking about, we can just reduce this down a bit or simplify it a little bit to say, what we're doing is we're just being honest that the person I was speaking about, he could go drinking if he want drink as much or as little. He had the consequences to deal with that. Your athlete, he he can do what he wants and, and, and figure stuff out for himself. Anyway, when we talk about supporting autonomy, we're just being honest with people by saying, actually, this actually is entirely up to you. And, and if we're doing anything, we're really de-technologicalizing it, if that could be a word in any anybody's we're just really making it quite simple and saying look this this is actually over to you and and i get why why it's why it's difficult for you now and and i'm i'm here if i can in some way i'll help so it's it's really just kind of being honest about what's going on it is up to them always and i think that's a, a wonderful place to jump into your question brendan and i agree sure it is about being honest and, and realistic mm. Accepting reality is, is a big part of supporting yeah. the So, Russell, what do you got? Yeah, uh, there's one question quickly uh, that, that came in. It was, it's a follow on from Steve's earlier response to Terry and also what uh, Brendan was saying about working in the middle. It's come from Evelyn van der Haar. And she'd ask that, does what you're saying mean that autonomy in the middle is both autonomy for the trainer or therapist and the client? Uh, does it free the both of them up to work together? If I could just say yes, <laughs> uh, that would do me. <laughs> I'm done. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> Go oh, on, God. Steve, add to that. <laughs> no, I, I agree. It's a yes. So, so I think at, I think at this point we're going to um, shift to the roundtable, aren't we? Um, let me consult my handy. Um, my handy guide. Yeah, we're going to bring Margot and we're going to bring um, Freddie back and we're going to all have a conversation. And here's what I would like to start with. Um, Margot and, and Frederick, since, um, and, then, and then Brendan last, if you have any comments on what you've heard or any reflections on what you've heard from our, from our friends and colleagues, that you'd just like to, uh, to share with everybody. Then we'll go into questions from Russell. Yeah, I have, uh, I had a visceral reaction to this last one because it felt, it, it just was right in the pit of my stomach. It was like, yes, this is it. And it's more of what I heard, and this is the, what I've heard throughout this is ex accepting the, your client or the person you're working with, their reality and your reality has nothing to do with it. It's removing me out of, this, out of what we're doing. Um, and I think that's core of what I've heard all day today is removing me and being there for the person we're working with. And to be in the middle with them means having them take the lead, but also helping guide them through the process. So there's this beautiful partnership that happens. Yeah. Roger. Well, I, what I might want to sort of add to it is this, First, the, um, uh, that I sort of agree with a lot of things that's been said. And just to, to add from, from the environment that I usually work, um, which is sort of very uh, constricted, um, I've heard people or, or staff um, trying to, I wouldn't say support autonomy, but to say you're responsible for your own life. And the mess you're in is is your own fault, yeah. especially when the, the the client or the inmates 
gives voice to their frustrations. Mm -hmm. And they would say, well, it's your responsibility and what you do with your time here is, is up to you. You can mess it up or you can comply. It's up to you. And said with a tone of voice that's um, from an upward position. Or condescending. Yes, that's, I don't know English good enough to know what that, that means. That, but that's the word that came to me, Frederick. Our, okay, sorry, it's not my native tongue. Um, so the thing that I, that I sort of come back to is the, is the mindset of, of wanting to be helpful and, and, and sort of seeing the other person as having expertise as well. So we have some expertise from our professions and our experience and have meeting um, with a lot of, 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 of patients or clients, but they have expertise about themselves, their choices, the way they want to do things, what has worked and what has not worked. And it's, it's, supporting autonomy is a, is a way of honoring that expertise. Mm -hmm. and, and sort of the skill of doing that um, especially in, if there is an, an, a, um, a clear power Im imbalance, is to mind your sort of tone of voice. And I, and I read in a, in a, in a book from, from Bill Miller about listening well. And he said, mind the music in your voice and not just the words. And I thought that sort of sums it up pretty well especially when supporting autonomy in restricted um, uh, areas, is that you need to come across as someone who cares. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, you know, my, my experience has been that sometimes no matter what um, other people do with, to, or for a client, they're still gonna do what they're gonna do. They're going to make their own choices based on what's important to them at that point in time. Yeah, great point. Brendan, now that you've been able to catch your breath, is there any... Anything yeah, you just, I mean, um, that it's, it's a point quite related to uh, what Frederick was saying there, that when we're talking about autonomy to support, because we've, we've mentioned a n number of things today, um, about what you can say to people and stuff like that. But it's so much more than this thing about words. And Frederick's point, who, you know, I mean, yeah, Frederick saying English is not my first language, and yet wow. he makes these amazing wow. uh, statements. Absolutely. And I think, you know, because uh, I love this guy like a brother, I know he has five or six other languages. So, you know, don't worry about the fact we might not get every word that you say, friend. <laughs> But when he says that, and he just draws draws the atten my attention back to, um, it's not just about the words that you say, and um, because you can, you know, you can. He he said it so well earlier on as well. You can say all of the right words, but in the bigger picture of in a corrections facility, telling people you have uh, you're in charge of yourself is uh, is patently untrue because they're not in charge of so many things uh, in their environment but but actually really zeroing in on what people are genuinely in charge of and um, because making these kind of catch-all autonomy statements of it's all up to you um are the the kind of victim blaming statements that he also mentioned that sometimes people use you know you're responsible for for how your life is this this turned out this way because of the choices you made that so much of this is is talking in big general terms and it's really important around i think around autonomy support to go right back to detail just as margot did um, when she was talking about that, that young person she was working with and going right back to saying, you know, what are you able to do? And, and really zeroing in on it and staying away from these big generalities because they're just patently not true. Great. Thanks, guys. Let's, uh, let's open it up, Russell. We'll bring you forward. Um, yeah. I'm sure we have some questions that you could put out there for, the, for, our, for our group here. Yeah, there's a couple of really good ones. Uh, one that came in earlier on in the webinar, it's from Dave Rosengren. And David asked, 
uh, uh, I guess for all the panel, what can you say about how, uh, what you mean by autonomy support differs from what is meant by independence? Whoever wants to take a, take a swipe at that, go ahead. I, I can I can speak to it from adolescence. Independence can be um, just a state where I have to make decisions on my own. You can't move me. You can't judge me. You can't do anything to make me do anything. Versus autonomy support, I'm choosing to make some of these decisions in my life, and I'd like you to be behind me. I'd like to do this together, and so when we're doing this autonomy su support, it's the dance. And the independence is complete separation, at least okay. in my mind. Yep, that makes sense. Yeah, I go along with that. And something something I think very, very close to what you're saying, Margo, is, is that when it comes to independence, you are, you're almost kind of going it alone and to hell with it, I'll put up with the consequences. Um, and I can do that. And to a large extent, that's true. That's that's the, the honesty and the truth and the reality we were talking about that people can. But also there's this thing then of, of okay, well, tell me a little bit about how come we're even having this conversation then and, and starting to kind of work out. And is there a role for, for you to support them in some way in that? Uh, and hopefully, in a way that makes them and the people closest to them makes their life better. And if I can add on to that, independence is um, sometimes very lonely and isolating, where autonomy support is very empowering. Mm. Beautiful, lovely. Yeah, and I can't help thinking about a personal situation I'm into in at the moment, which is I've got this new little puppy. <laughs> and I, I, I kind of can empathize with what mothers feel like. Kind of what I'm wildly out of control. I'm distressed. I'm frustrated. I, I feel so almost potentially abandoned with this little thing. Then I have this friend called Terry Moyes, who's on this call, and she is a she's a trainer of dog trainers and and, and dog owners. So, you know, knowing that I've got a good connection with Terry, let's just assume that I've got a good friendship with Terry. It's no problem at all for Terry to give me advice. And in fact, it's what I want, okay? And when she gives it to me, I don't feel my autonomy has been threatened or undermined by the advice because I want it, because I feel connected to her, I find it incredibly helpful. So I don't want to be independent. It's the last thing I want to do, but I do want to be autonomous. I do want to kind of take Terry's advice and think, yeah, okay, I get it. Okay, I won't, we won't have meal times for the puppy for example. We'll just let the puppy eat when it wants to. Big deal for me. I know you, you guys are giggling away, but, you know, I don't see, like, the promotion of my autonomy as being something independent of receiving advice. I'm delighted to receive advice. I don't know if that's helpful. That was a bit of a personal rant, forgive me, but I just saw a connection with Terry there that I couldn't help pointing out. Don't <laughs> worry. All right, we, we got one more time for one more question before we have to start moving towards closing down. Okay, uh, there, there's a recent question come in from uh, Jason Fever. So Jason's a fitness trainer. And Jason has asked about uh, uh, clients who would come in and they might prefer an authoritarian approach uh, to the to, to service. But how would you approach autonomy support when you've got clients who prefer to be told what to do? How would, you, how, would you, how would you blend the two together? Give me well, an example. Part of that would be, for me, I'm going to jump right in, would be a little bit of a balancing act in, in terms of the world of, of personal training and people wanting to, to kind of get to reach fitness goals would be that, that if that's working well and the way and the, the approach, you're, the more directive approach you're taking isn't one that has the potential to make them feel worse about their situation and you have what Steve and everybody's been talking about a relationship that can hold that kind of direct um, 
encouragement or pushing people to to go beyond what they believe they can go beyond, then I then I would I would say keep doing it. But what happens is, in my experience in working with personal trainers, is that's the only trick they have up their sleeve, and they lose a lot of people because they because they don't want to get bossed around. And so then I think what you have to do is you have to be able to. On a, on a kind of almost an intuitive level or a, or a feedback level of what you're getting from your conversations with people, be able to gauge and calibrate how much, how much assertion or how much pushing you can do without bringing them into the conversation. I, I think the, the, the MI in sport um, webinar that Steve and I did, we, we touched on some of this. I think some of the coaches there really had some good insights into that. And, I, and I'd encourage you to go back and take a look at that. If I might add to that, I think it also taps into that sort of wider discussions about um, giving advice or a more uh, directive style. And it, uh, from research, it seems that the sort of MI approach um, has a bigger impact or better outcome for um, what we call marginalized groups. So, so people that are used to being told from an upward down perspective, what they should or shouldn't do, um, and maybe have had that from, from, from an early age, um, they are in a state of defensiveness around their own autonomy. And, and one very sort of um, visual uh, way of expressing that that I that I've seen a lot on people that I work with is that they tattoo on their body only God can judge me, and that's a very sort of powerful statement of from early on say I don't want to be judged I don't want to be told what to do I want to defend my right to make choices for myself and and what you talked about sort of the independence is that it's also a very lonely place to be. And, and what I have found is that the, the autonomy support and the coming alongside um, is a very sought after relationships for people who are defending uh, their autonomy. Yes. Yeah, no, I, I've worked with a lot of people in alcohol and drug who felt like what they needed was a they would say, what I need you to do is give me a swift kick up my backside to make me to make me do this. But that's not actually what they needed because that's what they've been getting their whole life. Um, they needed somebody to have a different approach more along the lines that, that everybody has, has um, highlighted this evening. Now, with that, I'm very aware of the time. And we have, um, we have a couple of other things on our, our menu to get across. Uh, on be, um, I guess on behalf of Steve and, and myself, uh, Margo, Brendan, Frederick, thank you so much for donating your time um, and, and, and having this conversation with us. Um, clearly it could go on and on and on and in and, and, and some arenas and, and different times in different places it will, but um, it's greatly appreciated. Um, and any questions that come through, we'll try to get them to you. Um, so you can answer directly. Great. Thanks very Thank much. much. Lovely to see you all. And thank you for, Thanks for having me. No. Okay. Um, Steve, why don't you um, why don't you go ahead and take us out? Yeah, we're sort of we're getting right at the end here, and um, this is a call from the heart um, to you all to give me a minute to champion something that's very special. So um, Joel and I have decided from the beginning that we were going to not just have webinars, but that we were going to direct our energies and focus through acts of, literally through acts of compassion. And to that end, we're supporting the guardians of the national treasure. Now this uh, wonderfully named not-for-profit organization has a very serious purpose in one of the most dangerous townships in Cape Town, which I believe has the highest homicide rate in the world. Ballet, football, netball, you name it, 
uh, Ralph Bogers and this not-for-profit have been promoting this kind of work. And when Joel and I first started, that's what Ralph said he wanted, made contact with him. They needed football boots and they needed kit. Then COVID descended. And the focus now is on feeding people and keeping social distance and promoting the barriers of lockdown, so to speak, for everybody's benefit. So in a moment, we're going to put a URL and Stephen might have well already done that. And our request is to give it a click and give it a go, however much you donate. Honestly, it's, it's hugely appreciated. And from our last but one webinar, Ralph sent this brief video clip and you'll see what a wonderful heartful bloke he is. And I can tell you the donations go literally straight out there into the field. And personally, I don't think this is charity. I think it's work that just has to be done. It's that urgent. So over to you, Ralph. And I think Stephen's gonna play us a brief video, put the URL in, and then after that, we'll tell you about the next webinar. Yeah, thanks, Steve. I'll pull that video up. Now the URL, if you want to donate, is in the chat. So if you have go, a chat, go. Just... <laughs> we need you. We need you. <laughs> Ralph sent me this on a WhatsApp, I believe. Yeah, this is the one. Hi, good day from Cape Town. I'm Ralph Bowers, the founder of the Guardians of the National Treasure here in South Africa. I'd like to thank MI and Beyond for your generous donations. Without your help, the work we do here in the community would be impossible. With the funds we receive, we'll be buying two non-tac thermal denominators. We'll be buying masks, sanitizer, gloves, so we can still support the community in terms of the safety, the social distancing will be looked at, um, informing people how to um, wash their hands. So thank you very much. And besides that, we will also then be feeding the kids and the families that need the support from us. So I'd like to thank you very, very much. And Professor Ronick, thank you so much for all your help. That's one really beautiful man. And I can tell you that what started off as feeding the kids is now feeding everyone. 3,000 meals a day is what Ralph and his volunteers are putting together. So there you go, guys. Um, um, that's Guardians of the National Treasure, and we appreciate whatever it is you can do. Joel, just before we say goodbye, the next webinar is on the 15th of, of July. And guess what? We're not entirely sure what it's about. We know only one thing which has got some incredible people lined up. I believe one of them has already been involved in this webinar, Terry. Uh, she yep. we might have lined her up, which is- Yep, she's on board. I promise you it's gonna be dynamite. I've got another surprised guest and we are gonna work with them to produce something really useful, we hope. And uh, until then, um, our best wishes to you. Yep, it's been a pleasure, Steve. And everybody, thanks for coming along. Any ideas or comments you have, please pass them forward. And I think on that note, thanks to our guests, eh, and thanks to you all, I can see there's a lot of you still online, but if you could quietly, gently remove yourselves from our presence, please. And um, us folk who left back will just briefly have some discussion about how it went. And thanks for all your comments and things. And people from all over the world, it's amazing. Yes, absolutely. It's, it's Hi amazing. to Jess in Kenya. I wish I was with you out there. This is definitely worth for. We've got lots of folk from South Africa, Thailand, Chiang Mai. I saw someone. Excellent. Yeah, truly superb. So the numbers are dropping down and people are saying goodbye. And um, I assume Stephen wants us to stay online unless he tells us to get offline. Yeah, Steve, I think we can all get offline and um, I'll send you a link, Steve, for our private Zoom meeting in two minutes. <laughs> okay, all the best. Bye, guys. Cool. Bye. Lots of love. Good night, everybody.